Welcome back to Open Relationships Transforming Together. I'm your host, Andrea Miller, joined by my co-host, Joanna Schroeder, and our amazing producer, Brian Atkins. We have Marion Williamson back on the show, and oh my gosh, you can't miss this episode. No matter where you are on your self-development journey, whether you're just at the beginning or you feel like you're close to mastery, the conversation we had with Marianne, the insights that she gave are extraordinary. So practical, so empowering. If you care about your, your emotional freedom, as much as I care about my emotional freedom, this episode is for you. So let me introduce Marianne Williamson. Oh my goodness, I am so happy to welcome Marion Williamson back to Open Relationships. Marion Williamson is a political activist, spiritual thought leader, and best-selling author who has written 16 books, four of which have been number one New York Times bestsellers. Marianne has just released yet another book called The Mystic Jesus, The Mind of Love. And if you're watching, you get to see the beautiful blue and white cover. She has worked throughout her career on poverty, anti-hunger and racial reconciliation issues. She co-founded the Peace Alliance, has vigorously advocated for a U.S. Department of Peace, and just concluded an impassioned campaign to be the next president of the United States. Welcome, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Okay, let's jump into the Mystic Jesus. Being a huge fan of your work, what I really noticed, what felt different to me was how much more open and vulnerable you are in this book. You punctuated several of the points with your own vulnerable stories that were really humanizing. And I just, I was curious, why, why, why did you make that choice? It seemed brave and bold and it was great for me as a reader, but I'm curious, why'd you put yourself out there like that? I think I've always done that in my work. You know, I think when we, I've, I've always felt in my work, tell enough of your own story to make it relatable, but not so much as it sounds like it's all about you. But I think sometimes the, the stories that you're referring to are, this is what it looks like when you get it wrong. You yeah. know? So I thought yeah, it was helpful. That's what it felt like, like at this lunch, I completely dragged the past into it. And I could have had a miracle instead. I didn't. In this meeting, I could have come in in a positive attitude. I didn't. And it could have been a different meeting. I mean, when you hear, uh, you know, what it looked like in somebody's life, I think we can all relate to it a little bit more strongly. Well, and I think it, I think because of how famous you are and you're a thought leader and you've achieved so much. And so what I appreciate is that you're willing to be human and to show where you're vulnerable to make those points. And I think that's why it comes across as that much more impressive, right? Because not many famous people are willing to do that. And it, it is to your credit as a teacher. Well, I think that that's always been a hallmark of my work, actually, this kind of humor that comes along with that. Um, and it also, I think, is one of the places where I've been least understood by those who in the political world created narratives about me that have nothing to do with who I am. But it's dangerous because there are, it, we're living in a moment where there are huge institutional forces which would have us color within the lines that they've determined, which has to do with a particular kind of economic and social ordering of our society. And there is a great viciousness shown towards people who would in any way even suggest that we do differently, much, much less challenge those who would prefer we not. Now, in the spiritual realm, I had never encountered anything like that because in the spiritual realm, you're writing books. And, you know, in the spiritual realm, people who don't like what you're doing, they're not the ones who read your books. They're not the ones who show up at your lectures. So I had never encountered anything like I mean, I'd had, yeah, I mean, I'd had mean things said, blah, 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 but nothing like what you experience in politics. So I understand why a lot of people want to approach the topic of uh, personal transformation within the bubble of uh, what we all know to be a pretty safe place. And uh, 
listen, I want to scramble back to it myself. But, you know, there are a lot of hours on the diary. So Martin Luther King said we need external changes in our circumstances and internal shifts on our soul in our in our souls. So obviously I believe in both. I run for president one year. I, I come out with a book on, on the mystic Jesus in another year. To me, uh, uh, you know, I, I think they're equally important, the internal and the external changes. Martin Luther King also said, he said, the desegregation of the American South is the political externalization of the goal of the civil rights movement, but the ultimate goal is the establishment of the beloved community. If you just skip right to the establishment of the beloved community, but you don't attend to this desegregation part, you're not in transcendence, you're in denial. But if you just do the desegregation part and you're not working on the establishment of the beloved community, then white supremacy will just take another form. It will, the symptom will simply transition into another symptom. So I think that that's really the meaning of the 21st century mindset, which is the holistic whole person nature of things. We're people in the world and we are people in the sacred space of our own hearts and both need tended to. I always say pray in the morning, kick ass in the afternoon. Yeah, oh, let's, I let's love rewind that. a little bit. On, I want to come back to your book. Oh my God, so much to cover. I'm I'm really curious, especially since you were on the your book came out in May and you were on the campaign trail for some time. This is a book about the mystic Jesus. How did evangelicals respond or how are they responding? Well, you know, when you you and I are speaking at a point which is this this in between phase where I'm not off all the ballots yet uh, for the um, uh, in the primaries. So even though the book has been published, the big burst is just beginning now at this time. Oh, there I are see. Okay. a lot of progressive uh, Christians out there, and I will be. Well, actually, I have. I've talked to a couple of people who are not, uh, I don't know if they call themselves evangelicals, but they definitely refer to themselves as Christians and rather devout Christians who have appreciated the book. My, what, in writing the book, I wanted to talk about, it, it's, let's introduce ourselves to the metaphysical meaning of Jesus. So Jesus as a human being was born 2,000 years ago. And we know about the historical um, uh, Jesus, and many of us have read a book by Elaine Pagels, called uh, the Gnostic Gospels. And it was about the fact that these two roads diverged. And one was what came to be known as the ecclesiastic tradition, has to do with the establishment of a church, the idea of the organized institutional church being basically that which brokers your relationship uh, with oh, right. Jesus the, the and with political, God. Kind of the political branch of Christianity, right? Right, right. that's right. the institutional- Control, right. command, money. Uh, and then, well, yeah, uh, and also some very devoted, sincere people throughout yeah, history. Yeah, some good stuff too. Not but like I, some, I do yeah, think some good of stuff it too. too. As I, the yeah, command and control is a big part of it. Well, definitely for for the purposes of this book, it's it's not so much. I wouldn't say command or control. I, I'm not saying as a person I don't agree with some of what you're saying. It's just that for the purposes of this conversation. It's not so much command and control as it is a sense that they have the right to monopolize the identity of Jesus, that they okay, say right, who right. he is. Yeah, no, we're on the, right. you, yeah when you right. talk about the two branches, it sounds like there's a branch that was kind of organized and... And then I'm trying to get, um, yeah, and I'll get to the second right. branch. So that first right. branch says, this is who Jesus is, and we're telling you who Jesus is, and this is your relationship to Jesus. The second is uh, the Gnostic. That's why the book is called the Gnostic Gospels. It has to do uh, with the discovery of the Nag Hammadi manuscripts, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the Gnostics and the Gnostic mystical traditions have often been both literally and figuratively run into the hills. Um, this is where your but command I, I and don't, control. I'm not even familiar with the Gnostic. I feel like a like kind of a, a Luddite over here, and maybe that's appropriate. <laughs> Andrea, you would love to dive into the Gnostic Gospels. It's so it's 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 such a um, it's such a relief to find out that there is a different side of the history of Jesus than what we were sold, sort of prepackaged by the men that took over the story and commodified it. And like all of this beautiful love and respect for femininity too. That was what really blew my mind. All right. Yeah. That's so I just wanted Marianne to just so like, so you've given so, me a little bit of color, but right, just to, right. for our, the rest of our listeners, what are we talking about Gnostic? Right. 
what, well, what we're talking about is these two roads have to do with the exoteric and the esoteric. And it's what Joanna said. So the exoteric is this very externalized notion of Jesus and an institution and a group of people connected to a church that will tell you and will broker your relationship with him. The Gnostic tradition, the mystical tradition, is the idea that the internal teacher, what in the Course in Miracles is called the internal teacher, is within us that the Holy Spirit is a guide, but it's not a guidance that you get from without, it's a guidance you get from within. And so the mystic Jesus is the Jesus we come to know, not just as a historical figure who lived 2,000 years ago, but as a spirit who lives in our hearts today. Now, the Course in Miracles, which is the, the basics of the basis of the teaching that I present in this book, uh, does not say, in fact, says that he is definitely not the only one. There's one truth spoken in many different ways. Jesus is not the only portal. If he is your portal, you come to know it. But it, it is not presenting a teaching, and that's a big difference right there. Many cr uh, traditional Christians say he is the only path. Um, a Course in Miracles would say he is one name on the door. So, but that does not mean that he is less than a miraculous overlay, should we choose it, of consciousness that has the power and the authority given by God himself to untwist the places in our subconscious mind where we are twisted, to lift us up in those places where we can't quite get there by ourselves, if the trigger is so great, if the wound is so great, if the assault is so great, that there is this power given by God, which is in the Course in Miracles called an eternal communication link between God and this disconnected consciousness of humanity. Now, the Course uses traditional Christian terms, but it uses them in decidedly non-traditional psychotherapeutic ways. So the Course says that Jesus lived on the earth, but while on the earth so actualized his consciousness, the divine consciousness, which is potential in all of us, which is getting to the level where every thought we think is purified by love to such an extent that nothing else is left. When, if, if Picasso came into your room and said, would you like me to look over your sketches and help you? Oh, would okay. you say no, right? If you wanted to learn to paint. So Jesus is someone who I know you're having a hard time choosing love in that moment and still getting your needs met. But I have been authorized if you want me to, I can't, I can't do it if you don't ask me, cause that's a violation of your free will. But if you do want me to come in there, my mind joined with your mind can shine away the ego. So I could say, I'm in this fight with someone. I know they're an innocent child of God. I know that if I hold on to this grievance, it's not going to work out for me. If I'm in attack or judgment or defense, it's not going to work out. I can't get there by myself. If they're triggering me on such a level, Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to see this differently. And I would appreciate the help. And the Course says, um, he, the, the Holy Spirit responds to the slightest invitation. So that's what the book is about. The book is about who is Jesus when seen from the perspective of a, an elder brother. The Course in Miracles says he's an elder brother. He is further down the path than you are. We are evolutionarily still kind of in a barbaric, fear-based place. He's made it all the way. And one of the lines of the Course that I really love, he says, when you find yourself very confused and you can't get there, reach out in your mind's eye, reach out your hand as a child would reach out their hand for an elder brother. And then the line in the course is, I assure you, this is no idle fantasy. Yeah, I, I mean, what I love about this book and uh, Return to Love, which is like a Bible for me, is how practical these these 
lessons are. I mean, they almost feel like truisms if you're willing to do it, if you're willing to see the other person as innocent, if you're willing to say, um, uh, I'm willing, you know, I feel hurt, I feel angry, I'm willing to see it differently, right? I mean, and so, you know, for me, I'm, I'm so grateful because this, um, this work that you've done has been so transformative. And yet I find myself and, and, you know, it's why I started the questioning with, you know, our questions rather around how, how you have, you know, you're, you're the master of this stuff and yet you, you still struggle. Right. And I say that in, 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 you know, and I, I have worked so hard to get it right and I still struggle. And that's, so when I think about that, like, so it's, um, just a matter of humanity to say, okay, we know these, th I mean, here's the thing, we know these things and yet we still screwed up. And I'm wondering like, what do you like? So I, I feel like I, if I was to ask a question to myself, well, that's why it's a practice and that's why you keep doing it. But what's your advice to people that just feel like, oh my gosh, I know I, she's telling me what to do to, to, to like a small child, put my hand out toward my big brother. Why don't we do it more often? Do you, do well, you there get are many my question? Things. Like, why, where, yeah. we, like, I, I personally, I hit that wall. I mean, I just got into this thing with somebody that I'm close to and I'm like, oh my God, I know better. <laughs> but then I still screw it up. Well, but the issue is what you do at that moment. So first of all, in terms of it being practical, the Course in Miracles prides itself on being a practical course. All of this is practical. The Course in Miracles says enlightenment begins as an abstract concept and then makes a journey without distance from the head to the heart. So we're, you know, all of us at this point have read the same books and, uh, you know, listened to the same tapes. So just knowing these things up there, you said something, I'm a master. No, no, I'm not. I'm not an enlightened master. An enlightened master is someone for whom the application of these principles every moment becomes automatic. I'm not that. Like you said, there's stories in the book where I talk about it. This is when I blew it. But part of one of the principles is what you do when you know you've blown it. And that's where things like the atonement comes in, taking responsibility for what you did, uh, reinterpreting what just happened, forgiving others for their having hurt you, and all that kind of stuff. Now, this idea of, well, I don't know what to do, you know, it, we've got to stop coddling this in ourselves and in others. I think we need to even stop that conversation. You do the practice. If it's the Course in Miracles, you do the Course. So we need to, like, get out of that, I don't know what to do. No, no, we actually do know what to do right? So I, I think like for myself as a Course in Miracles student, and I think for many, um, uh, for many of us, we're in paths that stress the importance of the, of the morning, for instance. If you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is go to social media, the television news or whatever, and download all that stress, it's, it becomes very difficult if that's how you start your day without meditating, without praying, without reflecting, without aligning and then you're just taking the assault of the fear-based right. stimulus yeah, of the you become world. a sponge let's for all stop that it with I don't yeah and so let's stop it with I just don't know what to do we do know now we know how the brain operates most of us do and we need to stop coddling that in ourselves and in each other if you don't pray meditate reflect do something in the morning to set your consciousness then don't be surprised that you're depressed by noon and it's the no different it's no different than uh, working out with weights, no different than doing aerobics exercise, no different than doing the 12 steps, no different than doing Pilates. If you do it, it works. If you don't do it, it doesn't. And, and you don't say about physical exercise, I don't know what to do. No, you know what to do. You just haven't done it. When you, then you say, what's your resistance? Well, whether it's in the physical body or in the, in the emotional and psychological body, there's definitely a downward pull of gravity. There's yeah. no doubt about it. And especially at a certain age, if we aren't working at keeping our muscles up, they're headed down. The same with your attitudinal muscles, because the older we get, the more experience we've had, the more like either. So, but we have to take responsibility for that. You're going to let yourself sag or you're going to do the work to keep it up. And I think that... These days, um, that has got to be the conversation. 
Now, there's plenty in my books. There's plenty, certainly The Course in Miracles itself. There are so many paths. And at this point, I think, and I think to some extent, I have to say, the personal growth industry, whatever you want to call all this, in its own way, and I say this as someone who very much identifies with it, my own career gave me my career. I'm one of them. I've written these books. Right. But yeah. we have contributed to the problem. We have contributed to the infantilization of people like, oh, poor you, were you mm -hmm. wounded? Enough mm -hmm. with, oh. are you okay today? What trauma are you going yeah. through today? We have got to get in the habit of saying to one another, what great thing are you doing today and how can I help? Mm -hmm. Which Amen. I see in both of you, by the way. That's why I love your show, Andrew. You, I've always felt very supported. That modeling is very important. Does that make sense? I, well, we, totally. we have a world to gonna... say. Well, I feel like we're in a world where there's so much blame and so oh much my God, about, yes. you know, there is, I mean, and on the one hand, we do have a rigged system. I mean, we were just talking, you know, we spent 20 minutes talking about how freaking rigged the system is. And yet I loved, I mean, props to you for saying, you know, that I hired that person. It was a, like a, I, I hired a bad egg. There was something unconscious that attracted him to me. So I, I mean, probably what I love most about your work is your um, brave, impassioned call for all of us to take more personal accountability for ourselves. Well, and it, we can do that in so many different ways. Like uh, uh, I just finished my book about teenage boys and so many people go, ugh, teenagers. And I'm always like, teenagers are amazing. Like we have created so much bad energy around oh, teenagers. Right, yeah. And a lot of it came from our parents and that came from their parents that, that, they go into the this home where we're going, oh, it's the teenager again. What do we think they're going to act like? Instead, That's it's really like, interesting, I've, Joanna. Had, I've had this experience of, of, of if I'm willing to see how funny they are, they just get funnier. If I'm willing to see how sweet and vulnerable they are, and I'm talking about kids with the, you know, the dirt stash and the acne <laughs> and the big shoulders, and they are loves. Not every that's single beautiful. one, but that's, they... They that's have beautiful. all that in them. And I I keep thinking, how many things are we doing that with? How many things are we going in and going, oh, that terrible three nature that judgment, phase. right? I mean, you're right that if how we show up is what our experience is. In fact, Mary and I say to my kids, my kids will say something. They're 11 and 14. You know, I can't do this. Or, you know, they're feel I'm like, okay, if you say so, right? I mm -hmm. mean, it's that's like- That's all that the really universe is ever saying. All the universe is totally. ever saying is, if you say so- well, well, totally. And that's where when I, when I think about, um, you know, a lot of people will hear the word consciousness and their eyes will glaze over. But it, it is really practical. And you, you share a great example in the book about somebody, an artist was doing, I think, a one woman show, said something nasty about you in the show. You were sitting in the audience. You took a long time to um, to address it with her. You said you were really careful about writing an email because you didn't want to write to her in the consciousness of a victimhood and you said when you finally did write it when you got clear and if you will purified it was like she could see it and she sincerely apologized and to me when i just think about that as this amazing lesson about how we show up is what impacts our experience i mean it's so obvious and yet so often we, you know, we want to blame the other person. And yes, it sounds like that person was nasty to you, but it was a, a wonderful, again, great reminder of, of doing it the right way. And well, in the, you know, this goes back to what you were saying, what do we do? So as a student of the Course in Miracles, the Course will have certain principles. And then it, it refers to those principles and it says, they are tools in your problem-solving repertoire. So what happened in that particular story is, as you said, I, I attended a play. I thought I was doing this woman a, you know, a favor in the sense I was trying to be supportive, yeah, showing, showing up in her play. Her. Yeah, and she took a slap at me in the play, and I was embarrassed, and it was in a town where people knew me, and I just I was very hurt by it. I was like, what just happened? So I'm walking out, and I had attended the play with a friend who was a therapist. 
And I was walking out. He said, I know that had to be pretty tough. If you want to process that this week, you know, call me anytime. And I, and I started to go there, started to play the violin in my mind. Poor me. She was so mean to me. I've shown up for her, blah, blah, blah. And I heard this. I didn't hear a voice in my head, but I got very clear of the thought, which is one of the principles in the course, the Christ in you cannot be crucified. The Christ being the pure love in you, and the Course in Miracles says who you actually are, you were not uh, created to be at the effect of lovelessness in your, from yourself or anyone else. So I got in that moment, okay, Marianne, you're totally at choice. And this goes back to your saying, what do we do? That's what the book is filled with. That's what any spiritual practice, this is what you do. In that moment, you have a choice. We don't always have a choice what happens to us, but we always have a choice what we do about it. So you can go into victim. You can even post about it. You can, oh, poor me, I was so nice to her. Or you can say, that, that's, I don't want to go down there. Do you prefer to be right or to be happy? So I just remembered that. I just remembered that. I gave it to God in my mind in that moment. I got, if I just leave this to my ego mind, I'm going into this. I got hurt, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't want to be in that place. I want to be in victory, not victimhood. And, and that's what, what the pause gave you. That's what right? the, pause, the pause. That's what the Course in Miracles calls the holy instant. Go within. Take a moment. Don't just start with the lack of social, of, you know, all of us are lacking impulse control these days. I got a text about this. I, I got, you know, right? So what happened was I had to go to the ladies' room. I went back into the theater. And when I did, I ran into a woman that I hadn't seen in a long time, I think years. Oh, hi, how you doing? Hi, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? She said, I'm the producer of the show. Did you like it? Now, because I had already had that, that realization and because I had already had that moment of silence, how I expressed myself was not from blame, but from vulnerability. And I said, well, actually, my feelings were quite hurt. I mean, that line in the show, like, wow. And she said, I'm so sorry about that. I, I mentioned it to her. You know, I think that's rough. I don't know why you take a hit at Marianne, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, I was, she said, but I'm sorry that you were hurt by that. I said, yes, of course I, I was. I said, what do you suggest that I do? And she said, I would write her an email. And it was one of those situations where you know how sometimes you're with a friend and you have the friend read the email. And I kept going over it because I knew the course says the ego mind is attack and defense attack and defense. And if you have a grievance, you can't have a miracle. The, the universe is re to correct, correct this, but you can either have a grievance or a miracle. You can't have both. So I remember working on the email. I would read it to my friend Richard until it was just a pure expression of, you know, I did need to say something. It wasn't the, one of those, oh, get over yourself, Marianne. It was one of those things, something needs to be said, but how are you going to say it and who are you going to be when you say it? And uh, finally, he told me, okay, it doesn't have any barbs in it. It doesn't have anything like, after what I've done for you, any of that crap, blah, right? And uh, she wrote me back, and she apologized, and she changed the script. Um, but that moment, uh, you know, I had a, you, 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 we live in two parallel universes. And so no matter what happens, you, we can, if we do go into that pause, into that Willingness, you know, the Course in Miracles says, I'm willing to see this differently, then we can take a path uh, that leads to uh, correction of whatever detour into fear has been made. And when you talk about those other examples in the book, like there was one example, you know, where I just went into a meeting and I just had a negative attitude. And you learn before you go into the meeting, before you go into a room, send your love before you. Mm -hmm. Just pray, you know, yeah, send your love. See Totally. It's so practical. And it it's really is so just... practical. And, and it has to I do mean, with how just... the brain operates. It has to yeah, do we with were the just subconscious talking about, mind. Uh, James, James Doty about mm -hmm. his wonderful work. And it really is. I mean, it's like this is really practical stuff. It's not. Absolutely. I mean, we think of consciousness as kind of this esoteric thing. And, and maybe in some ways, you know, that maybe the esoteric is maybe not the right word because it feels kind of like out there and new agey, but the truth is it is super practical. 
Well, and that's the point. I'm sorry. That's the point of the book. This is not just some abstract theological concentration here. It's the idea that there can be an overlay of consciousness that lifts you up. Because we all instinctively, we've been trained, go for the attack, go for the defense, go for the I'm so hurt, go for the victimhood. And like you were saying, people are mean today. I, everybody's yeah. so angry. And then with social media, and it will just eat your soul if, it, if you let it. You if know? you let it. Well, and that's uh, one of my favorite, uh, um, I guess, hacks or just easy takeaway from, from your work and this book, uh, The Mystic Jesus in particular, the gift we give ourselves when we let somebody else off the hook, right? And, and how we can let ourselves off the hook. But I really want to differentiate that and, and go back to the example that you just described. And I, um, with that, you actually did address it, but you addressed it in a really, in a way that was sincere and true. Because I do feel like you can say, I'm just going to let the, the person off the hook, but then it still kind of eats at you, right? And so to me, there is a difference between advocating for yourself but really, really, really getting honest with yourself and being accountable for those negative feelings and working through them like you did with your friend Richard versus saying, I'm just not going to worry about that. I'm just going to sweep it under the rug. And then it comes out in ways that lead, you know, lead to, uh, you know, your own, you know, illness in the, you know, well, sort of the, the worst case. There are two categories that I talk about in the book. And if you, if you attend to your own inner radar, you can tell which it is. Sometimes it's, oh, get over yourself. This is not a big deal. Let it go. Yep. Yep. Those moments are there. And then there are other times, and that was one where, no, this has to be addressed. Like you said, you have to advocate for yourself, but be very careful. Because if you do it in the form of an attack, then you're only hurting yourself. And then it's going to be about how you are or whatever. <clears throat> well, so, it feels like that feels like the whole point, right? Where it's like we are all like, so I, you know, I was wringing my hands a few minutes ago. It's like, oh, my God, and I've screwed it up again and I've screwed it up again. And then it's like, but Andrea, the, the point is that every time you screwed up and then you um, oh, uh, you talk about like the resurrection, right, as this like opportunity to do it differently and to give yeah. yourself grace and to give the other person grace, it kind of feels like that's the whole and freaking And Andrea, point. we this we said this on another recording where Andrea was hard on herself and I said, stop talking about my friend that way. Andrea, you accomplish so many of your emotional goals so often and I caught myself making fun of myself for trying to get into a new project now that my books are I'm looking into PhD programs, trying to find another book to write. And everybody who knows me knows I'm exhausted, but I caught myself doing it. And I just for a moment was like, I caught myself doing it. But what do you mean doing it? Like, like, like perpetuating my uh, overly busy, uh, don't stop, keep accomplishing, um, never rest, grind yourself down thing. I caught myself about to do it again. And I felt down on myself for a moment of like, oh, I'm doing, then I was like, oh, but I caught myself and I stopped. And well, like you has- make different choices all the time that should be celebrated. He says on the course, I cannot take from you what you will not release to me. Stuff has to come up in order to be released. It says you can't bring the light to the darkness. You have to bring the darkness to the light. So when you ask for healing, the healing comes in the form of like a magnifying glass that's put on your own stuff so that you see it. Because when you see it, then you can let it go. Um, uh, uh, One of the lessons that's meant so much to me in the last uh, while is called, uh, there's nothing nothing my holiness cannot do. Both of you have mentioned having younger kids. You're still mothers with kids at an age where you can sit your kids down and say, no, you listen to me. Mm-hmm. The Hang one on, of the I've big... got a kid right here. Let's see. He just happened to, can, if I say you listen to me, are you going to listen to me? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe with my 11 year old. Look so at do, that uh, sweet a teenager. A pod, that is pod, a sweet teenager. Bummer. All right. Thank you. Thanks for being my little prop. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, get some, get some wellness i hope one uh, of the awesome. one of the issues that is becoming very uh significant 
these days, and um, you'll write books about this in a little while, has to do with being the mother of an adult child. Because once they're adults, you don't get to say, you sit down and you listen to me. Right, right. And one of the things that is just such a big deal at this time is so many women talking about their complicated relationships with their adult daughters. Oh, right. Uh -huh. And it gets very complicated because the adult children hold something over us, and that's the grandchildren. We don't want to do anything that makes them not want to let us see the grandkids or be with the grandkids. So many people are like, are like, uh, just walking on eggshells. So what happens these days is that the adult children they set their boundaries very clearly. And if you talk about this or do this, then we really want you to be the grandparent. And we're really excited that you're here. If you overstep. So what you were just saying, Andrea, I and every woman I know who is in this situation, oh my God, oh my God, I shouldn't have mentioned that. Oh my God, I shouldn't have brought that up. Oh my God, I knew not to talk about that. I knew she didn't want to hear me say that. It's just what you said. And then you stop. And it's been so, so important to me that one lesson, there's nothing my holiness cannot do. It's like in the Superman movies where the Superman who is the Christ figure can actually reverse time. So there's a part in the book about the atonement where you can go back to the moment when you made the mistake and you give it to God in that moment. There's nothing my holiness cannot do. It's really interesting because, um, you know, one of the principles is that the, there is the, all minds are joined. So if, if you do that, then the other person feels it. But that's a really, let me tell you, that I, I don't know if any books are written about that. I'm not the one who's going to write that book, but... Um, there is a whole thing going on these days um, with adult children. You, you have a feeling it's going to get easier. It actually, that's just as complicated. Yeah, no, we've, we've observed a lot of um, adult, of estranged men and um, adult kids going no contact. I mean, it certainly seems like it is getting to maybe even a, a crisis level. Thank you. How common that Thank is. Thank you, Andrea. It really is. And let me tell you something else. I've been reading articles. There is something about the DNA of the grandchild, which is actually in something about all the eggs that are in the mother. And then the somehow, somehow my granddaughter is somehow DNA connected to me in ways that they didn't know before. Oh, oh so okay. it makes sense because I, like every grandmother I've spoken to, you really have a love for this grandchild. It's very deep. And this idea that you messed up and they might not, it's, thank you for mentioning it. It is a crisis. Um, yeah. Because like when I was growing up, I, you didn't even think you had that right to ever tell your grand, your parents, they couldn't come over, <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, I, I, <laughs> yeah. But I, I also kind of feel like back to, I mean, just talking about uh, on the one hand, um, you know, the, the world is a really challenging place. And then, you know, at the same time, you, you literally said, and there's reason to be optimistic because something really beautiful is getting born. I mean, it feels like that pendulum has to swing where you're right. It wasn't an option. Um, if you were an adult child and you had a toxic relationship with your parents for you to do that. And now people yeah, are going, absolutely. Oh, I can actually make that choice. But, it, but it's now the opposite. Now it's saying, Oh, okay. I'm going to, um, hold my my kid ransom, which is terrible for children. I mean, babies need their grandparents and aunties and uncles and extended family. You know, it just it feels like it's yet another opportunity for that this consciousness to reach people that go, oh, my gosh, um, I felt all that that hurt. And you just even talking about the moment of where you can go back and say, OK, I screwed it up here. Let me try again. And I realize if you're blaming your parents, you're carrying that the blame. And that is dangerous and it's terrible for your kids. And what's so ironic to me when I watch some of these like TikToks and Instagrams where, you know, the um, one in particular, the mom is talking about how her child went no contact. And then the same mom is talking about the terrible relationship she had with her mom. And I just want to say, like, oh, my gosh, like, are you listening to yourself? 
right? And so on the one hand, I realize there's some of these adult children that are, are you know, they have their misgivings and the, and the blame and so forth. But I also just want to say to the parents who are saying, I don't get it. Like, there's an opportunity for you to say, maybe if you really don't get it, to say, help me understand. And then I realize kids will yes. go, it's not my job to help you understand, right? I mean, it just feels like both sides have the opportunity to just to take that pause and say, okay, this really hurts. What can I do? Right. And because it really, it's, it, it is, it takes both sides and both sides are, are over there pointing to the other saying you're to blame. And, and then, and then well, and they think yeah. they can, you know, just be, get off scot-free with saying, all right, I'm just going to go no contact as though that's not going to impact them. And they're holding on to that resistant or that, um, that hurt and resentment. Yeah. But, but what happens with a lot of this, and I've heard it from so many, uh, the mother has expressed her opinion about something about the way the child is being raised, okay? And the, the, the daughter has made it clear, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't look at that the way you do. So at a certain point, there's nothing left to discuss. You just have to bite your tongue. Yeah. You just have to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> you know, and then the verbal discipline. But I feel like it's it's what you're saying as well. Like, okay, on the one hand, yeah, maybe you just have to shut your mouth. Fine. That's that okay, that's a good idea. That's a starting point. And but it can I be hard. Like, well, that it for you to say, okay, what am what am I missing? And let me be curious and let me really be open um to the the uh, choice that my daughter is making or my daughter-in-law, right? Because for us with boys, it, okay, maybe mm -hmm. it's not about the daughter. It's about the daughter-in-law, right? And that, which so would that almost be, even, be worse you know, because you really have no tougher. control. Yeah. yeah really... And so it just, it strikes me that it's back to that feeling of how am I willing to show up? Am I willing to show up sincerely curious, you know, sincerely yeah, open-hearted? Even... Even when you say that, you're positing that the other person would be in the conversation with you. Yeah, but you can't control you know, that. You can't control that. You know, and some of the, and some of it's like uh, they don't want to discuss it. They just so it's just all. I, I do think that the topic of raising adult children is becoming, like you said, Andrew, and I'm glad to hear that you, that those who don't have adult um, children but who are in the psychotherapeutic field are seeing. This is like a crisis, and I think the heartbreak is like nothing. It's really extraordinary what I've seen and what I've experienced at times. It's, whoa. So Joanne and I have kids from what I think Ray is six up to 19. What it strikes me is that parents are so well served when they are still living at home to, to really build that healthy, open accountable relationship. And I say that because, I mean, that, I mean, command and control, I was talking about that with the, um, you know, with um, kind of hyper -politic politicized churches and, and, um, and religious organizations. But I also feel like somewhere along the lines, the memo that a lot of parents got is, it's my job to control, it's my job to command. And when I think about how my my relationship with my kids have evolved beautifully and they're only 11 and 14. I always say they're my, my, my little Buddhas. They've taught me a ton. I, I feel very hopeful that I'm going to have a beautiful relationship with them as they become adults because I am curious about them. And I do say sorry when I screw up and I have worked so hard to meet them where they are and we're I, doing so it so I think about differently. What parents do now, okay. So if you say if someone is like, "All right, that um, you know, there's a no contact situation," well, all hope isn't lost. Like, get get the mystic Jesus, you know, and do the work. But for the parents <laughs> who do have their kids now in their homes, where they can, you know, um, um, mend that relationship if it needs to be mended. I mean, I just, it feels like a clarion call to me because of the crisis that we're seeing with the, you know, 20, 30, 40, even older kids, you know, that I just say to these parents now, like, ooh, take take the advantage now to be accountable yourself. 
And that just, it's like, and it, it can be really hard, right? But that's what we're called to do as parents. We can start that open conversation. And like, I, I keep going back to this pause that we were talking about, taking the pause before reacting. If we can model taking the pause, we can teach them to pause. You know, we can teach them to make room for that wisdom to come in so that we aren't just all the time, right? Well, the other thing I wanted to just from there, um, Marianne, in your book, you I, I don't know if I got it exactly right, but you say something to the effect of how relationships are the ultimate training ground. Will you talk about that? Because so yeah. I mean I feel like the yeah. back to like the, the blame and it's always about the other person, but I don't think so. Well, the Course in Miracles says that relationships are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And it says that every situation, if you think about it, is a relationship. So in every relationship and in every moment, we're making a choice. Are you going to have an open heart? Are you going to work to be kind? Do you want to be an affirmation and a blessing on the other person? Are you creating a space for the other person to be all that they are? Or is it a playground of your ego mind when you're just coming in there using, exploiting, you know, the spirit loves people, the ego exploits other people. What can you do for me? This is all that stuff. We know that. You're either heart is open or your heart is closed. And relationships will be one or the other. Now, what the Course in Miracles says is that relationships are part of a highly individualized curriculum where we are assigned to people. Everybody you meet, you are supposed to meet. Anyone you're supposed to meet, you're going to meet. And in every situation, uh, you have the opportunity. When I was in this situation last time, how did I handle it? Because if I handled it well, that's good. Let me try to even be better this time. And if, it's just, if this is bringing up something where I didn't handle it so well, this is my opportunity. Handle it better now because it's really not about what happens to us. It's about who we choose to be in the space of what happens to us. Somebody that I work with did something yesterday, and um, it really triggered me. And it would trigger me too much. And she left, and I thought to myself, why am I so triggered? Well, I, I totally understood why I was so triggered. So when she came back, I simply, you know, said, you know, explain the situation and, and um you know, I said, I'm sorry, I got so intense about that. This is what happened. And when she heard what had happened and it, she totally understood, but that in any given moment, we either can have an open heart or recognizing where we had a closed heart and make it right. You know, it's like well, a GPS. Hearing, yeah, hearing. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I think the universe works like a GPS. So sometimes you take a wrong turn. The GPS automatically recalibrates to get you back to the destination. So if at that moment you take that holy pause, as Joanna was saying, like, oh, I got off. I got off the road here. I got off the road. And how do you know you got off the road? The Course says you know that you're in aligned if you feel peace. And if you don't feel peace, what just happened? And what's your part in this? But well, you know that will align, tell the truth as soon as you know it. Yeah, and that just that ultimate accountability. And I can say for myself when it's like, oh, I feel angry or I feel hurt or I feel triggered. And then I do the right thing about it and versus holding on to it. And I, you know, even listening to you talk about that example where you you were accountable, you explained what happened. And I can imagine it was just like this instant kind of like, okay, great. Now now, not only are we okay, but maybe even a little bit better than where you had been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that's that's what happens when you're accountable and open And then you ask, well, then you ask, well, what would you prefer to be? And what I would have, what I would wish to be next time is able at the moment of the trigger to stay within my heart and explain, this is why this is a really difficult thing for me if we do it this way. And I think would have been, totally understood, you know, in life is always about where is that moment where you, for whatever reason, something in your past, don't know how to express your love and get your needs met. So it's almost like an emotional muscle cramp and we cramp up and we get constricted. When if we can soften right there, people will hear us. I was reading an article the other day, which would totally go along with this, where it said neurologically, if you create in a situation, 
you have a pattern that's, let's say, dysfunctional. This article was saying if you make a conscious choice in a, in to go in a different way, the next time that happens, that it literally creates an imprint on your brain. I believe it. Yeah, that's so... Uh, I mean, absolutely. Um, it's, there's a lot to faking it together, you make fire it. together. Yeah. Well, totally. Absolutely. And then you, you change that pattern. And then the, then the, the, yeah, that plasticity causes you to, to go, oh, okay. You know, this is, this is a little bit easier. You know, you just, it's like creating a new pattern. Um, I have Marianne, a, I oh. have an example of this because mm -hmm. I think people learn really, people often learn best by hearing a story. So I, when I was first, maybe the first five, maybe even 10 years that I was with my husband, it's now been 20 years. He would want to come up behind me when I was busy doing something and hug me. And you see this on movies and in music videos. It's so romantic. It's on a Hallmark cards. And I, I hated it. I hated it. And I would, I would bristle and I'd be like, oh, he's so annoying. I'm so busy. This is so annoying. And it's interesting because it happened at the same time I was listening to Marianne's Course in Miracles on Oprah satellite radio where it was like this reaction I'm having feels so much more than annoyance and I honed in over time on being it I went to a high school where we were just constantly kind of groped by the boys in the school and I started connecting my body's having this memory of not being safe and it was so much I was so scared to tell this to my husband because I didn't want to compare him to a groper. Like, you're groping me. But my body was saying, you're being groped. This is not safe. And finally, I said, I just have to explain this. I'm starting to connect this. And the moment that the truth was there, it was like we were both free because he mm. was feeling ashamed for Good job, being Joanna. Rejected. I love it. Yeah. And I was feeling ashamed for not liking the thing everyone's supposed to like. Right. And it was like my body knew that that was not working for me at the moment. Were you then able to go into that pattern of his coming up behind you and enjoy it? Or he just changed because he understood? You want to know something funny? He changed because he understood. But what I was able to learn recently was he wants to have someone come up behind him and hug him. Oh, that's great. And that's so great. I do that and he loves it. And I'm totally comfortable hugging him in those moments. I don't necessarily like it. I also have ADHD. So if I'm washing the dishes and someone hugs me, I'm probably going to have a thousand wild thoughts that distract me. But he loves it. So then I'm like, I can give that to him. That's beautiful. And maybe that's what we can do more with our kids too. It's like we're talking about this estrangement thing where where it's like something's coming up in you that's making you feel really uncomfortable with what I'm doing here in your home. Or something's coming up within me that's making me feel really uncomfortable with what you're doing with, with my grandchild, with your child. And maybe we can kind of, again, that pause and be like, what's the deeper thing that's happening? Well, the deeper thing that's reasonable. happening is that it's her child, not yours. And she gets yeah. to that. I mean, that's the deeper thing that's happening. You had your chance with your kids, and now they have their chance with their kids. Yes. <laughs> and when you can get to the point where there's no you should in your energy, then they might hear what you have to say. But until then, keep it shut. And maybe when you're over there, you can model something you think is wonderful. Yeah. And maybe that's a suggestion. But this this other way isn't working for any anybody that I know. Yeah. It's so hard Marian, to let go of control. Yeah, totally. Marion, what haven't we talked about with the mystic Jesus that um, you feel like um, <clears throat> okay. is important for people to, to get? Thank you. Um, a lot of people in the new thought community, um, transformation, personal transformation, I'm spiritual but not religious, but, you know, people will say they're spiritual, but almost keep God at a distance. Right. And we'll talk about great avatars, but have this almost aversion to going to Jesus for the reason that you said, the command and control image, like... The polit politicization of Jesus, right? And the monopolization of who he is and what he means by a particular... A religious structure that says this is who he is, this is what he means, and this is how you relate to him. And St. Augustine has a line, ever ancient, ever new. What is, if you free Jesus, and, and I'm Jewish, so I had never been, you know, I'd always been told when I was a kid, we don't read that book, honey, we read the other one. So I was never told anything. So when I came to the Course in Miracles and began to think about what that meant, 
it was interesting because then when I started talking to some of my Christian friends, they were like, oh my God, what's happened to you? Have you become a born again Christian? What's happened? And I began to realize that I was learning new things. They were having to get over old things. I just brought an oh, ignorance of like, I've never even thought about this stuff before. They were bringing all kinds of layers of ambivalence. Mm, okay. So yeah, you were able to get it fresh versus they got it with all the baggage. Yeah. So what I find in Students of the Course in Miracles, and it says that, you know, we come from all religions and no religion. Some people, it's a, it's a more expanded sense of what they already have. Sometimes it's completely, oh, wow, that, that's what that is. You know, sometimes you hear people talking about levitation and miraculous physical phenomena. Well, that guy walked through the walls, remember? Walked on, turned water into wine, walked on the water. I mean, hello. So for those of us who are interested, like what? I just think that there's a liberation from old strictures that people are ready for. And when I began to write the book, it was because a publisher said to me that in the publishing field, the biggest uh, request is for books about Jesus that are not necessarily tied to Christianity. But oh, so many people feel okay. like they threw away the baby with the bathwater. Can we get just the essence? Can we get the gold without, do I have to sign up for all the dogma and the, dogma and the doctrine? So right. I hope that this book is an aid in that process and that journey. Oh, it totally is. I mean, I, I was born, I was raised Christ, Christian-ish and, you know, you know first communion and, and Catholic school and all that stuff, or at least, you know, Sunday school or whatever. And so for me, I, I was raised with, um, with the baggage and so forth, but I've always come back to this idea of Jesus as this profoundly wise, loving teacher and how um, he has been co-opted and how he, it's almost like he needs a rebrand, right? And so what I love about the mystic Jesus is the reverence you have for him as a, um, an idea and, and, you know, and how this idea is inside of us and we are part of a, a whole, a, a, cosmic consciousness if you will and that that it's almost like he somebody who had been embodied that we can relate to and i realize my you know i my husband's uh indian and hindu and so like i think of there are many you know many faces and so that's very much of a, a hindu thing but i so i think of that that people feel like they have a um relationship with jesus and that that to me is what makes him particularly like he has a great brand right but he's like better than coca-cola <laughs> you know what i mean and so i think of so that that idea that that the the publishers can see what an opportunity there is for people to connect with the idea of a jesus in a way that is personal to them and then in your beautiful book uh, just to make it really practical and relatable like that that is that gives me especially considering we started this conversation talking about corruption and um malignancy and all this you know kind of negative stuff to end it with just talking about how practical this book is and how accessible it is whether you're hindu or christian or jewish or no religion at all right that to me is what you have done a, a really beautiful job with this book. and i have to oh, say i was raised so evangelical much. i was raised evangelical in an evangelical town and originally hearing uh the course in miracles series on oprah really gave me a spirituality back because i knew i couldn't do the thing that i was raised to do and it was like it was such a binary if you can't do that then you're a sinner and it's done oh well i reject the church then so then it was like Oh, there's more. There's this great sort of Southern or evangelical phrase that's Jesus take the wheel. And I, I still say it. And as you were saying, we can open and make space to hear this divine quiet where we can get the wisdom, find if, whether you think it's from you or you think it's from Jesus or you think it's from the universe. It's like, I'll say sometimes Jesus take the wheel. And what I really mean is like, I'm just going to give this away for a minute. Stop trying to control it. And we can have both the loveliness of Jesus and um, not have to 
co-sign all of the baggage that goes along with it. Yeah, it feels like it's kind of a, a pure, a, a bit of a liberation. And and even, uh, Marianne, how you talk about just the profound sense of disconnection that our ego causes. And so when I think about whether it's Jesus take the wheel or I feel hurt and angry, but I'm willing not to. I'm, you know, I'm asking for a miracle, that feeling of like, ooh, I am part of this, this whole, this, this loving intelligence. It works. I mean, that, and then like you talk about going into a meeting and saying, I'm going to bless the meeting. And I mean, when I'm mad at somebody, <laughs> I'm like, Andrea, send them loving kindness. And right. And then I'm like, feel it. I send that. If you and and you, all... feel, I mean, and critically, I feel it. I'm like, oh, thank God that I have at least enough wisdom right now. One neuron is firing to say, send the loving kindness to that person that really upset me, right? That's practical. We all know we've been in rooms where you could just feel that people don't like you and also rooms where people can feel that they were blessed. You know, this business about Jesus taking the wheel. Um, when you're driving in a car, and we, many of us have had the experience where, oh my God, I'm going out of control. And you're taught when you're young, learning to drive, don't grab on the wheel. Take your hands off and let centrifugal force will take it from here. And Jesus take the wheel is the same thing that if you grab onto this right now, you're going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. So it's the spiritual, psychological, emotional equivalent of what happens when you're Car is going out of control, and you know to take your hands off the wheel, and you can feel it right itself. Wow! Yeah, that I mean, a it life really lesson to... that as above, so below. That these things actually are true on the physical level. There are objective, discernible laws on the physical, and there are objective, discernible laws on the on the invisible planes. And when you say Jesus take the wheel, you're actually not just speaking to some cool metaphor. You're actually speaking to, when you say Jesus, the mind is automatically reminded of its eternal connection between yourself and God, the holy pause. You're just taking all these out of control energies, getting your hands off, let it realign, the universe will realign it. So that Jesus take the wheel becomes a very profound instruction to the subconscious mind. Not, and not then just you a go good back uh, to learn. Yeah. Right. You go back to a lot of those old things and you hear them differently, which happens in a lot of areas in life. When I think of things that my mother said that I thought were so old fashioned and retro, and then you go through life and you finally end up, oh, it's just what my mother said when she said, count to 10 before you say anything. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's all humbling. It comes full circle. I have a crazy idea, Marianne. I mean, listening to you, having read your book, um, in context of people are going to the synagogue, to the temple, to the church, less and less. There's a loneliness epidemic. Would you ever think about starting some kind? I don't know if you'd even, I don't know if you'd call it a church, if you'd call it a temple. But I, I for one, would love if every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m., I got to tune in to Marion Williamson um, giving a wonderful gospel on on all of this stuff. Have you ever well, thought you about can go something to, like that? Well, and I, in most of my adult life, I've been in places where I gave weekly lectures. Okay, and right. If, and people would say, oh, I feel like this is like going to church. And then also people can go to marianne.com and see my old Tuesday night lectures. There are many of them on there. Um, and the morning meditation. I've told yeah, Andrea, I you. Love you the love the morning meditation. meditation. I need to get on board yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, and that, hang on, let me say, <laughs> that's on the Marianne Williams, Williamson. No, marianne.com. Oh, Marianne.com. Marianne. You can get Yeah, you can Marianne. get them on the Substack. Okay. Or just go to Marianne.com. Oh, they come um, to my email. Mm -hmm. I think I think there is a difference between solitude and loneliness. I think most of us have felt it. However, I also think I think two things about loneliness. I think first of all, we have an aversion to the work that can only be done when we're alone and quiet. Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher centuries ago said, every problem in the world stems from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. So a lot of what people call loneliness today is really this discomfort with being alone. That's different than loneliness. 
It's a discomfort with being alone. Some of the alchemy, just like when you're about to give birth to a child when you're pregnant, and sometimes you realize, oh my God, so much is being born inside me right now. If I just sit here quietly with my feet up, maybe sipping up, uh, you know, some herbal tea, that's the greatest contribution I can make because so much is going on inside. Yeah. So I think cultivation of aloneness gets rid of a lot of loneliness because we realize that something is an... Um, could be a comfort zone here that's only a discomfort zone because we haven't built a relationship with self and with quiet. I, I agree. And that's why I'm advocating for you. Haha. <laughs> it's like Andrea, mind your own business, but I'm gonna I'm gonna advocate anyway. Um to to do something live where we show up together and you tell us every freaking Sunday or Saturday or Tuesday, but you know, there's something kind of sacred about a Sunday morning. Um I, I just, when I think about that, I mean, so often it's like we just, we, we drop the ball because we're, um, we're busy and we need to be reminded. And that, you know, so when I think about people leaving temples and synagogues and churches and so forth, not only are they losing the community, but they are losing, I mean, at least in the best places of worship, I feel like they're missing the chance to be reminded by yeah, a loving, well, I... wise person, hey, get your quiet time, you know, you know what I mean? Like, like, yeah, we, well, you know, especially if we're just, if, especially if we've gone no contact and we're not listening to our parents, <laughs> right? You know, if you, if you go to Marianne.com, I mean, I've done that most of my adult life, but there's also something with what you said. You, you said you're in Colorado, Joanna, you're in Los Angeles, right? You go down the streets, I go down Wilshire downtown Look where you look at the major temple downtown in Los Angeles. You look at those big churches. People used to show up Friday nights, a thousand people. Yeah. A thousand people would show up on Sunday morning and Saturday morning. Yes, you're right. People used to show up once a week in a sense of community. People used to show up on their front porches after work. They would talk to their neighbors. That's a large part of what's wrong with a, an economic system that has everybody so work to the bone and so stressed and anxious, they don't have time to just relax even. But the second thing I was going to say about that that I've seen in myself, some of the times I had gotten to a point in my life, a lot of it was based on the fact that I had a child. So because I traveled so much, when I was home, I felt I owed it to be with her. So I got in the habit of saying no a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to go here? Do you want to go there? And I began to realize when I began to feel lonely, you're always turning things down. You're turning down invitations. And, and the other thing was you're not proactively reaching out to people. So, you know, the Course in Miracles says, beware the danger of an unrecognized belief. A lot of loneliness for me when I would begin to feel it was you're keeping yourself isolated. Who could you call? When was the last time somebody, you know, I, just these little habits. Sometimes we cultivate habits of loneliness. And it's like so many things in the course where it says you're like people in a very bright room, your fingers in front of your eyes, and you're complaining that it's dark in here. Right. Yeah. That's that's back to being aware and accountable, right? And and that only, I mean, I, I've become a fan of saying only I can set myself free right and that's a choice and absolutely and it's the greatest gift in fact I was just on a podcast yesterday talking about accountability and, and it was a little I went to bed thinking oh god Andrea that was a little dramatic and I thought you know what it's not I mean when I think about um even Joanna what you were saying about uh, sharing these hard scary truths and that should be a relatively small thing because your husband adores you and you guys have been together for such a long time and yet it was still scary to tell him that truth and so when I think about account what accountability means to me it's telling those truths it's showing up it's being honest in in a way that I feel like I can be proud of and a lot of time that feels like it's walking into the flame but that to me is the, that that is the path to, okay. And if I'm doing it, then I give permission to others to do it. Marianne, thank you for um, such a beautiful book. I know I asked you, it's like, if there's anything else, um, you know, that you wanted to add. The one question I have for you is 
Was there an aha that surprised you in writing this book? Because you've written a lot of books. Was there anything well, you, you know, that you're like, the, oh my God. The Course in Miracles says people hear you on the level that you speak from. And the hope that any writer has is that something you write or say makes someone else go, aha. Uh aha, -huh. yeah. So I don't want to put a sentence on the page unless, to me, it's an aha. I think the reason that my career has had whatever vibrancy it has is because I'm genuinely amazed by these principles myself. And I'm never not amazed. And I'm never not in awe of how God works in our lives. And so to me, there might be something I've spoken about or read about by now thousands of times. It's still an aha to me. You can have a grievance or a miracle. Oh, wow. Until we're at that place, of enlightened master, which I'm not, then every time you get, you see whatever that is, it's another layer of a ha for you. Hmm. That so, is an amazing way to, yeah, amazing place to end. And it certainly shines through with this new book, The Mystic Jesus. And it, and it certainly shines, shines, shines through in, in everything that I've, I've read and listened to of yours at that, that sense thank of you. awe and belief Right. And even I think I may have said this to you before. I probably have read A Course of Miracles maybe a dozen times. I have my Kindle version with a million highlights. And then I've emailed those highlights to me so I can just go back and review. I mean, I read it literally like a bite. Like when I think about people that are um, read the Bible regularly. Right. That's how I have tried to internalize your wisdom. And so I thank you for another book. I thank you for being on our show again. It's you always great amazing. to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank and I'm really you. excited about that. Uh, uh, when I have my own podcast, I'd love to uh, interview you, Joanna, about teenage boys. I think that's great. Oh, I'd and love to talk about And anything that you've got, uh, Andrew, I don't know if you're writing anything or anything, but uh, I'd love to return the favor. Yeah. Are you thinking thank of you. podcast? That's next for you, Marianne? Yeah, maybe in August. Yeah. Oh, wow. I think yeah. that's going to be wonderful. I I, yeah. I I keep I always talk about that Oprah series. I got to find a way to get it to Andrea because it was so nice to be able to listen and to to take it in and hear Thank you. other people interact with it. So I think a podcast is going to be really cool. Thank all you right. so okay, much. Okay, you heard it here first. Marion Williamson's okay. podcast is coming. Thank all you. Right. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. God bless you. Have a beautiful day. Thank Bye. you. <laughs> all right. Oh, my gosh. Marion amazing. Williamson. Uh, amazing. I love it when we talk to Marianne and it's like the first part will always be a little like just a little, whoo, you know, kind of um, kind of um, uh, playing catch up. Or, I'm not even thinking the right word, but um, just a, just a little more closed. And then as we get into it, oh, my gosh, when Marianne opens up, it's like ray of light. Yeah. Pure well, rainbow and there's always sunshine. a lot to so is that she's doing so much. Like, yeah. where even are you in your life right now? Because writing books, running for president, <laughs> starting foundations, like, okay, yeah. okay, we got to get all caught up. We got to hear where you are. And then, <sighs> yeah, she helped us with our lives. <laughs> no, she hugely helped us with our lives. But what I always sit there when I think about uh, how great a steel trap her mind is, the quotes that she can reference, the things that she referenced with so much clarity. I mean, she really is a scholar and it's just always fun to talk with her because I always feel like I learned so much and how she um, frames things and the context that she gives things. It's really like, you know, historical context and like St. Augustine and Martin Luther King. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's so cool to talk to her. So. Anyway, I, I hope her. she's open to like, she's, oh, she was very open to my thoughts. And yeah. not just like, oh, yes, you said a thing. I acknowledge it. She She's absorbing what you and I are saying, which is really lovely. Yeah, no, she is wonderful. Um, all right. I hope you love the episode as much as we loved having the conversation. Uh, we are so eager to get your feedback, your advice. Please email us at openrelationships at your tango.com. We also are so grateful for those of you who are leaving comments wherever you're watching or listening to 
the show on iHeart or Spotify, YouTube. Um, please follow us. Please subscribe. Uh, it really helps us uh, as we are building our audience for this amazing show. Thanks, and uh, we'll see you back here again soon.